one of, one of the rules I've learned working with Jim and David is you, you try to start on time and end on time. So my name is Derek Davis. I'm the executive director of the Center on the Legal Profession. On behalf of both the lab and the center, we welcome you. Uh, I'm going to go through some uh, short housekeeping tips that will help you throughout the day. Uh, the folks from the lab have special name tags with the logo of the, the lab on the name tag, and they're always available throughout the day and this evening to help you if you have any questions. The folks from the center have red lanyards. We work with the lab, and if you have any questions for us and we can be of any help to you, please don't hesitate to ask. There are restrooms on this floor. Uh, if, if, if you're facing this way to the left, there are additional restrooms on the main floor, uh, right under the restrooms for this floor. Uh, cell phone chargers for those of you who are going to need your cell phones, and I'll come to that in a minute. If your cell phone charge is low, we have cell phone chargers in the room next door to us, so uh, you might want to duck out if it's, it's your battery's on red uh, <laughs> after the presentation to do that. Um, we also have an office, a business office, if you're expecting any, uh, or you have to email, or you need to take a phone call privately, we have a business center in the room next door, which we'll make available to you. And again, reach out to any of the center staff or the lab staff, and we can arrange that for you. Um, and then in front of you, it's very important, there is a release that allows us uh, to record this session and to share it internally and, and uh, reproduce it and distribute it at the lab scene appropriate, and we ask that you uh, review that carefully uh, with, with, as a lawyer, and as, as, as many of you are lawyers too, I can assure you there's nothing in that release that would, uh, that you should be concerned about. And finally, <laughs> <laughs> famous last words, right? <laughs> famous last words, and as I mentioned earlier, you are going to need your cell phone. And so, at some point uh, before we begin the breakout sessions and when Jim starts the polling, you'll need to text CLP Research to 22333. And, uh, and if you have any problem with that, we can come around and help you uh, later on in the morning. So now, we get to the part of the program. Uh, and I'm delighted to have the privilege to, to, to introduce the Dean of our law school, Martha Minow, who's the Morgan and Helen Shu Dean Professor of Law. Martha typically doesn't need much of an introduction, and I, I promised her I would be brief. Among the Dean's many accomplishments and publications, it should be noted, though, that she clerked for Judge David Bazelon of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and then for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the Supreme Court of the United States. She joined Harvard Law School as an assistant professor in 1981, was promoted to professor in 1986, and was named the Hen William Henry Bloomberg Professor of Law in 2003, became the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law in 2005, and became our Dean at the, as the inaugural Morgan and Helen Chu Dean, the Professor of Professor in 2013. Uh, the Dean is an expert in human rights and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities. She also writes and teaches about privatization, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. Uh, Notably as well, in 2009, President Barack Obama uh, nominated Martha to the Board of Legal Services Corporation, a bipartisan government-sponsored organization that provides legal assistance to low-income Americans. And the U.S. Senate confirmed her appointment on March 19, 2010. It's a delight to have the Dean with us, and I yield the floor. excited to have you all here and every single person here really we are thrilled uh, by your presence and by your commitment Derek it's a completely appropriate that you would say something about cell phone charging because you charge us all up uh, thank you so much and thanks to the entire staff both of the center and of the lab Let me just say just a, a word or two everyone in this room is here because you know and you care about access to justice but also, um, that doesn't mean I can't say why I know and care about it. Um, it. It is a crisis right now. The crisis is an overused term. But there really is a crisis in access to justice in the United States. In criminal law, I don't really need to explain. We're the most incarcerated uh, society in the history of the planet. Um, and while a bipartisan and state and federal uh, consensus 
around reform seems very present. Political opposition seems also very present. Just on the issue of uh, access to lawyers, the standard recommendation is that there be no more than 150 cases per criminal defense attorney. The typical standard in this country is 800, even though there's a constitutional guarantee of access to uh, representation. And the New York Times, in a recent study, found that 1,600 was the caseload in one jurisdiction. On the civil side, Americans who cannot afford legal help routinely forfeit their rights because rights don't enforce themselves. And right now, our justice system is inaccessible to millions and millions of people. And when we say that, who are we talking about? We're talking about senior citizens who get caught in phone scams that then tap into their savings that then leave them actually destitute. We're talking about veterans who can't access the benefits to which they are not only entitled, but we owe them as a society. We're talking about survivors of domestic violence, the disaster survivors who are struggling to get back on their feet, small business owners who are stymied by debt, and even people who know the law have trouble uh, being uh, navigating these fields and not knowing about the law is, of course, a tremendous, tremendous problem. One out of five Americans now qualify for civil legal assistance in America. Uh, that's measured on 125% of the poverty level. Uh, one of the offices that I visited recently closes its doors after two days each month because they're full up with how many cases they can take after two days of intake. The inaccessibility of civil justice in this country is so well known, but nobody seems to care that we're 94th in the uh, rankings uh, in, the, in the world, if you ask, um, on uh, measures of access to justice. Um, and one of the major problems, I can tell you as someone who's trying to keep the Legal Services Corporation funded, it's now been marked for zero in the current proposed budget, um, is to actually make the case. Which is why the meeting that we're here for and the Access to Justice Lab is so critical. Because it's kind of stunning how paltry is the evidence, how thin is the work. And I say that as a proud member of the Boston Bar uh, a Task Force on the value of access to justice, which found that for low-income individuals, returns on investment is $5 for every $1 invested in access to a lawyer. And similar studies have been uh, repeated, have been conducted all over the country, but that's about the level of the research. And it's pretty crude. Um, measures of success are also crude if you're only asking about access to lawyers, about access to other forms of getting legal help and legal information. And again, that's why this initiative is so terribly important. Nothing can actually change unless we have better knowledge and we actually know what uh, is the best way to use scarce resources. The one thing we know for sure is we will never provide lawyers for everyone who's entitled to one or everyone who needs one. And so what we have to do is to figure out what's the best way to provide the, the best possible route to access for justice. And the Access to Justice Lab, I believe, is the first serious effort to have rigorous research to address these questions. From the vantage point of the Legal Services Corporation, I can tell you this is daunting to simply get <coughs> raw case data in a form that you can compare across the states. And that's not even talking about what does it take to really use the rigorous techniques that statisticians would recognize, that social science would recognize, or, gosh forbid, that a politician might actually take seriously. Using rigorous field research, and especially randomized controlled studies, sounds like that's a big deal. And why are we doing this? Well, let me tell you something. In 1900, if you went to a hospital, your chance of actually doing better than if you didn't was less than 50%. So what made the difference? The reason that healthcare has progressed is because of randomized control studies, because of actually gold standard research. We've never done that seriously in law. And I'm very, very thrilled that um, that's what's going on right here. And using, of course, that as a technique and other techniques, and techniques that cut across all of the disciplines from sociology and marketing and adult education and everything else. You're gonna hear about the lab projects that are across the criminal and civil systems. You're going to hear about court-based, lawyer-based,
client-based programs. You're going to hear about knowledge that actually assesses what works while advancing uh, science about professional decisions making and about the motivations of uh, low income and uh, moderate income families and individuals and how they relate to information once it is given to them in various forms. And it is for me um, a privilege, actually, to have anything to do with this work. As it is a privilege to introduce my dear friend and colleague, uh, David Wilkins. David Wilkins is the founder and the leading light uh, of this center on the legal profession. David Wilkins has brought uh, the serious eye and attention to um, the study of the profession that it so much needs. David Wilkins has provided a home for Jim Greiner in his work on the access to justice that you're going to spend your time learning here. And David Wilkins will say more and more eloquently than I can. So can we just not let her go? Sorry. <laughs> Putting in a pitch. <laughs> She's giving me the evil eye. <laughs> uh, listen, my name is David Wilkins. I'm the faculty director here at the Center on the Legal Profession, and it is a great pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you. In fact, it's more than that, it's thrilling. But I look around the room and see the people who have come to give up what we always say uh, when we teach executive education courses in this space, which we do. We say, uh, you know, the most precious resource we ask you for is actually not your money, although we sometimes ask for that. Uh, it's your time. It's the one thing you can't get any more of, and every single person in this room is incredibly busy with incredibly important stuff. And yet, you realize two things. One is what Martha said, which is there is no issue more important in our time then this question of how do we fulfill those words chiseled on top of the Supreme Court of the United States, equal justice under law, the core legitimating principle, not just of our profession, but arguably our society, and we are badly failing at it. So you realize that, and you decide to give your time, but equally as important, you decide to give some of that time here to be with us to find out what Jim has built, which you will find out is incredible. So the, the Center on the Legal Profession is committed to trying to bring, you know, theory to practice and practice to theory. To try to bridge the largest gulf, I think, that we could all agree is out there between what's been happening in the academy and what's been happening on the ground. And it is to the detriment of all of us that that gulf exists. We are all poorer for it. And so when I started this, the idea was to try to do what we do best in the academy, which is to do cutting edge research at the highest standards on issues of critical importance, and then to try to take that research and to translate it both into the way in which we teach and prepare our students and increasingly professionals as well. That was the reason for starting the exec ed programs. And also to enrich the way in which we understand our world and the way in which we relate to, our, uh, to the issues out there and to ourselves as professionals. Uh, I can't think of any uh, kind of work that better exemplifies what it is we're trying to do than the work Jim is doing. And that's why we are so thrilled uh, to play some small role in helping Jim to do what he does. You know, Jim is in some ways a kind of an unlikely person to be a champion for us here. You know, he started with an idea. And that idea came from statistics, okay? We don't normally think that we're going to find the thing that moves us as lawyers from statistics, but in fact, he was right. And that idea, which as Martha said, is an incredibly powerful one, about how simply rigorously understanding how various kinds of interventions, what effects they have and what value they can create, can utterly transform a whole field 
and a whole society and a whole world. And it's exactly because he brings to it the most rigorous tools of analysis uh, from his background in statistics that he's able to do this world, uh, this work. But it's also because he's deeply rooted in law. He started out as a lawyer in the Justice Department. He's assembled a fantastic group of people uh, who have deep understanding of law. He wanted to connect with us because that's what we do, is try to understand deeply the way in which law and the legal profession operate, but also to look at it, as Martha said, with an eye, not just from the inside, but from the outside. Because frankly, if the problem is bigger than the legal profession itself, the problem goes, as I said, to the fundamental core of, of who we are. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about the techniques that he's been developing, about the resources that he has mobilized, uh, about the creative new ideas uh, that he has already come up with to begin to tackle some of the most pressing problems uh, in our system today. But I know that he would agree that whatever he tells you, that we will all walk out of this room much richer for the engagement and the dialogue of everybody here. And Jim has done a brilliant job with his team at putting together a, uh, a, a day that will engage you in every way and bring your ideas to the surface. So uh, again, I can't thank you all enough for giving us our time. Uh, I can't thank Jim enough for the work that he's been doing. You could read his bio. I told him I'm not going to say all that. He's got lots of honors and accomplishments. But what I care about the most is that he's the best combination of head and heart that I can imagine attacking this issue. And what more do we need than that? Jim Gray. As we get the slides rolling up, I want to tell you something about the slide. I don't care if we get through a single one, okay? And if, as I sit here and talk, I'm going to start to get more and more nervous, unless I'm interrupted with a question. So please interrupt me with a question. Help me out. Help me calm down, or else I'll start to sweat, and by the end of the presentation, I will spontaneously combust. Okay? All right. We have a problem in access to justice. We have a problem in law. We think we know everything, and we're wrong. That's our fundamental problem. We have law proud of, not just inured in, but really proud of the fact that we are exceptional at everything. We are really good at everything, and we don't need to listen to anybody else to tell us what we need to do. And we're wrong about that. And so a lot of the stuff that we do to solve the problems as lawyers that we encounter and purport to help people solve is wrong, and we don't know which part of it is wrong. So the scary thing is, some of the time we might actually be right, and we don't know. And this is the fundamental issue with the legal profession, and it's the fundamental issue with access to justice. And so this is what the Access to Justice Lab is all about. This is what the, uh, the objectives of the Access to Justice Lab are. We need to reduce legal exceptionalism. We need to combat bench and bar hostility to lessons from other fields. We need to get over the idea that because we are lawyers, we cannot learn something from any other field, and that we need to reinvent every wheel. The wheel has been reinvented a lot of different times, but we in law insist on doing it ourselves over and over again. And this is the fundamental lesson. You're going to hear a lot about randomized control trials today. I'm not going to apologize for that at all. You're going to learn more about them. You're going to participate potentially in creating an intervention for one. But thinking big, the randomized control trial is simply one example. It's a meta example of an idea from another field that we in law have resisted for decades. And it is simply an idea that infuses others because it tells us what works and what doesn't. The fundamental problem is that we in law think we know better than anybody else, and we don't. And so we need to test, we need to be more receptive to ideas from other fields, we need to generate our own ideas, and then test them. What is it then? What led us to this conclusion that says, we know, we know the answer already? It is a commitment to an epistemological structure, is a mouthful from a law professor, an epistemological structure about what works, how to get from here to there, 
that has two major components to it. One is what I see in my day-to-day -day practice. And the other thing is what the cool people tell me is true. Those are the two things that we trust as knowledge about what gets to here to there. We are professionals. We went to law school. We had to pass the bar exam. We had to practice. And we accumulated knowledge that way. And so that must be right. What we did, we are right because we did it. What we did is right. 40, 50, actually closer to now 70 years ago, medicine thought the same thing. We are roughly where medicine was in the 1940s. And medicine transformed itself, at least in part, at least as far as new drugs and new medical devices, into a science. If in 1935 you had uttered the word medical science, people would have laughed at you. Medicine was not a science. We can transform law into a science as well and realize the types of gains that Martha introduced in, in her introductory remarks to transform the legal profession into an evidence-based, efficient uh, profession that accomplishes the goals that it sets out to accomplish. And as we all agree, we are failing, failing miserably right now. What is a randomized control trial? Why is it important? As I mentioned, it is a meta, it is a meta tool. It is an idea coming from a variety of fields, statistics, for example, used lots of different places to figure out what works and what doesn't. And the fundamental problem with it, and the reason why I think it has been resisted strenuously in the legal profession, is that at least for a while, you have to replace a professional judgment with something else when you're allocating something or you know, treatment to control, whatever it is. You have to ask a professional, give up your control temporarily for a little while of who gets what or what happens to find out something. And fundamentally to a lawyer, there's an, even closer to a lawyer, nearer and nearer to our heart, we have an equality norm in law and in, and in, and in adjudication. We must treat equal cases, of, excuse me, like cases alike. It's the fundamental idea of our equality norm. But in order to learn anything, you must treat like cases differently. That's the only way you figure out whether something works. The, nevertheless, medicine and other professions have shown us that the randomized control trial, the statistical techniques, can live comfortably within a profession if indeed we want it to. And this is something that I'm going to challenge you to think about. Do we want the legal profession that we have right now? And this goes again to the hearts and minds of the legal profession. So what is an RCT? We're going to hear that, that acronym. What is it? Well, basic idea is you randomly allocate units of some kind, cases, defendants, letters that you're going to send out, whatever it is, to one condition or to another or to multiple conditions and then you measure outcomes. It requires you to identify outcomes up front, which in law I suggest we're not so good at either. Why is it necessary? It is the only way to tell whether some treatment that you're interested in causes some result. The only really rigorous way, not the only, only way, but the only really rigorous way to really tell you know whether some treatment that you're producing, you're, you're implementing, some intervention is a magic word, causes some outcome. Why is it necessary? Because you just don't know without randomization. Let me give you an example that I've used before, uh, which is about why you would want to use randomized control trial. Let me give you an example. Uh, lawyers in delinquency proceedings. Should we give lawyers to juveniles in delinquency proceedings? Should we do that in order to help the juveniles, to help the quote-unquote accused? They're not supposed to be called accused in juvenile delinquency proceedings. They're supposed to be called you know, the delinquent, the person that we're going to try to help. We're all going to sit around and try to figure out what's best for this person. Okay, folks who have been in these proceedings tell me that's not what they're like. They're like full-blown, full-dress criminal trials. But should we assign a lawyer to them? Well, what should we do if we consulted the evidence that's out there right now? Let's get some science on the case. And you look at non-randomized studies, and you'll find, at least as recently as when we looked at this three or four years ago, you'll find 13 studies out there. Okay? 12 of them, depending on how you count, not randomized. Seven of those 12 using regression, non-randomized techniques, statistical techniques. All of them finding that if you give a lawyer to a juvenile in a, in a juvenile proceeding, you will substantially increase the likelihood 
that the juvenile will be removed from the home, and you will substantially increase the likelihood that the juvenile will be incarcerated. Okay? Do you believe that? I don't, by the way. None of the studies were randomized, and there's a problem with them. And I'm going to keep you guessing for a minute. I'm going to ask you to think about what could be the problem here. What could be the issue that's causing this kind of strange result that suggests that giving a lawyer to a juvenile in juvenile delinquency proceeding is increasing the rate of bad outcomes for that juvenile? And what could randomization do to solve it? I'll tell you what I think a little bit later, but just think about it for a little while. Okay, so this is the, these are the access to justice without objections. This is an RCT. Why are they necessary? Exactly. Do you believe that? Because again, I don't. Okay? Let's keep going. Why is the A to J lab needed? Why is it that we're forming it? Well, why is testing required in medicine? Let's just take a look again at the, at, the, at the analogy for medicine. There are multiple phases. If you want to put a new drug out <coughs> there, uh, to, to market, there are multiple phases now required by law. Okay? You have an idea. You have some idea from some chemist in a lab somewhere. You identify some new chemical entity. You go through phase one, phase two, phase three testing, increasingly expensive in order to get it out of them into the market in medicine, okay? And I'm curious, what fraction of drugs clear that enter, not even that get here, but that enter phase one, what fraction of them clear phase three and actually get out to the market, okay? And this is where we get to have some fun with some toys. Pull out your cell phones, please. We're going to let you guess, okay? going to give you... Four choices. Text in A, B, B, or C. If you haven't done the texting thing already, look on your program. You'll see how to interface with it. Give it just a moment. So down at the bottom of your program, if you, if you need to get your, get your cell phone linked up, at the bottom of your program, you'll see that you can text who's the research, because there could be two more of these in case you want to participate. Okay? As a statistician, so far I would call this substantial uncertainty. <laughs> That's what the answer is, right? <clears throat> Don't quite know. Right. And one more second, and then we'll move on. So it seems to be 10% is winning, but not by a whole lot. Right. I'm not sure I would even call that I'm winning a little bit more now. <laughs> <laughs> Late covers are really depressed about the prospects. OK, great. Let me move on. The guess is sort of 10%, but not, not a, a super strong signal. OK? Still moving a little bit. All right. The answer is, in fact, 10%. So at the point at which you start, the medical companies start to invest large sums of money, everything that enters into that process, the medical companies, the drug companies are starting to invest large sums of money. One in nine out of 10 fail. Nine out of 10 fail, okay? We're gonna do one more of these polls. Where do they fail, right? Where do they fail? Because each stage of testing involves greater and greater investment of dollars and resources. So where do they fail? Where is the biggest drop-off? Okay, and I'm going to give you three choices. They fail phase one, they fail phase two, or they fail phase three. Where is the biggest drop-off there? Okay, I'm going to let you, let you text uh, again, A, B, and C. Fail phase one, fail phase two, fail phase three. Because again, if you think about, you hear statistics, billion dollars, that sort of, you know, 
fee and here, being there, it adds up to real money. Billion dollars get bandied about in terms of how much you're going to have to invest in order to get a drug from a lab out into the market. The big cost, the really, really big costs are in the phase three. They're on the back end. So if we happen to be able to get drugs out of the system and declare them failures early, we, wouldn't, we would be able to have less investment. I, again, would call that not so much of a clear signal. Right. Substantial uncertainty as to this, and the answer is, it turns out they fail phase three, meaning they spend all the money, and still, even after the phase one and phase two testing that has been done that are themselves frequently randomized trials, when you go to phase three and you actually stick it in patients in the hospitals that are going to use it, more than two-thirds of the drugs fail. They fail to emerge from that point, whereas that's what we do in law. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Because we know. Because we know already what the answer is. We are professional training. We have professional testing. We, meaning we test ourselves, right? Do we test ourselves on how to represent a client? No. Do we test ourselves on how to conduct a trial? What do we exclude from non-lawyers? How to conduct a trial, how to advise a client. We don't test on that anyway. Professional experience, we know because we are professionals. We know. Other fields have their own professional norms. And other fields have their own disaster stories. Right? If any of you follow medicine, the debate over hormone replacement therapy. This was actually out in the field until randomized controlled trials demonstrated really substantial issues, dangers with hormone replacement. Anybody know what scared straight is? You're going to prevent crime by sticking a bunch of teenagers into a prison for a couple of hours and having inmates shout at them. Okay? And it was so popular that it became in use everywhere across the country, and it became a TV show, a really popular TV show. Randomized control trial evaluations turns out to be a very good way to increase recidivism rates. Increase them. More crime. The cartoon is maybe one of my favorite things I've ever seen in my life. That's a robot baby. Okay? We're going to prevent or reduce teenage pregnancy by giving teen girls a robot baby for a weekend. The robot baby screams in opportune times. It does other things in opportune times. And the idea is that the girls are going to say, oh, gosh, this is so horrible. I am not going to get pregnant. As far as we know, from this randomized study coming out of Australia recently, it increases pregnancy rates. Okay? We each, each field has its own disaster stories. Actually, lots of them. The more testing that one does, the more disaster stories that one find, finds. But we in law, we don't test. Because we are that much smarter than everyone else. Because we know. Believe that? I don't, by the way. This may become a theme. If you ask me if I believe it, I don't <laughs> believe it. Let me give you another example of how we operate. This is old enough to where I think many people in who have been, have been involved with this, I think almost everyone is, has passed away or has retired. But here was a randomized control trial. Here we actually got one done. And let me tell you about the example, the, the reaction to it that we, that we uh, gave us, that we, uh, our reaction involved. So the idea is that there's going to be basically what amounts we would now call a settlement conference for appellate cases in the Second Circuit under something called the Civil, uh, Civil Appeals Management Program, CAM. <coughs> okay? Program, I believe, is still in existence in many circuits around the country. There has been subsequent evidence, but let me tell you about this piece, particular piece of evidence. So a Second Circuit chief judge says, holds what we would now call settlement conferences, case management conferences, in appeals. This is a somewhat important court, the, so, the Second Circuit of, of the United States Court of Appeals. Okay? And the judge all manages to quote unquote settle all five of the cases. All five of the cases settle. Now, mind you, this is the judge who at least is sitting on the court that is going to hear the cases. 
and who may actually be on the panel <coughs> who is going to hear, to hear the cases. Okay? And he succeeds in, sell, in settling them. And in print predicts that if we got lawyers, if we just hired lawyers, the Second Circuit just hired lawyers to hold these settlement conferences, we would get a 25% reduction, 25 percentage point reduction, meaning if it was 60% before, it would be 35%. That would be the oral argument rate. That's going to save us a bunch of resources, says the judge. There was a test done. I still have not been able to uncover the story of exactly how we managed to get a randomized test of this off the ground. But we did somehow, I meaning we in the legal community, and it found no statistically significant reduction in oral argument rates at all. So what do you think our reaction in the legal community would be to that finding? I'm not going to have you text a cell phone guest to this. I'm just going to tell you. And this is a quote. This is not, I'm not paraphrasing. This is a quote. The Second Circuit remained committed to the camp concept and maintained the program. And in writing, it, it, it credited the CAMP program with the success of closing more cases than were open. And it said, OK, now you've had fun with your randomized control trial. Can I please have more money to expand CAMP as presently constituted? The money came with the strings attached. You got to do another randomized control trial. We might give you some money, but you got to do another RCT. There was another RCT until the chief judge of the Second Circuit managed to exercise enough weight to kill it. It was abandoned because on the rationale that it was unfair to deprive the cases in the quote unquote camp control group of the benefits of the program. That was, I'm not, I'm not, that's the quote. Okay? And the RCT number two also failed by the pre-specified success criteria, which were themselves reductions from the chief judge's original predictions for the program. It failed by a hair's breadth. It failed. What's the reaction now of a somewhat powerful court in the United States? The report from the scientific body of the federal judiciary Federal Judicial Center. All persons sharing responsibility for management of the patient uh, appellate caseload should give these procedures serious consideration. The benefits disclosed by the first RCT, not the second one that failed by a hair's breadth, the first RCT persisted into the second one, into this evaluation. And we should go forward. This is our reaction because we know. Why is, this, why is the access to Justice Lab needed? Do we really care if, in fact, lawyers don't know? Well, we do. We do. There are costs. There are pretty significant human, fiscal, societal costs. We are in a pro se, quote unquote, crisis, but I, I just hate the word. This crisis has been going on for three or four decades. At what point do we stop using the crisis and say, this is normal? This is our new normal. It's not even new anymore. Three or four decades? That even feels like a long time to me. And I'm kind of old. Pro se is how human beings interact with the justice system now. Corporations, labor unions, incorporeal entities, fine. They have lawyers. Human beings interact with, with the justice system pro se. That's how we do it in the United States. And it's not going to change. It's not going to change. Resources are quote unquote getting cut, but they're always getting cut. They're so low right now that, as Martha mentioned, law offices are opening two days a month. Court systems are shutting down one way a week, one day a week, excuse me. And in this setting, we are ignorant of what works. We are ignorant of how to spend our money well, and it's not just wasted money, it's human costs. Here's my last of these cell phone surveys for now, okay? How many RCTs do you think we have this not powerful knowledge generating device that unwinds these potential problems with knowledge? How many do you think we have in the history of the United States legal profession? Andrea, you're not allowed to vote. My co-author on the project where we tried to count all of these, Andrea Matthews, 
We tried to count them all. How many do you think we have in the history of the United States legal profession? Okay? The entire history. RCT, for those of you that want to know, was roughly invented. The formal statement of it usually uh, to, credited to a guy named R.A. Fisher, who was trying to figure out how to grow plants more effectively, trying to figure out how to increase agricultural yields in the 1920s. Okay? Ideas were, ca were casting around before then. Okay? But, but mostly credited to him. So it is roughly 100 years old. Okay, since the idea was formally stated. Again, I'm not seeing any clear signal here. <laughs> I would say there's substantial uncertainty in the room about what the answer is. I'll give one more minute. I don't see anyone else texting. Okay, so what's the answer? The answer is 50. So roughly one every other year since the statement of the profession. <laughs> By way of comparison, the number produced in method medicine is actually impossible to count. You can't, you can't count them all. Okay? Another measure of the depth and breadth, both the depth and the breadth of our ignorance, things that have never been subject to RCTs that, that are related to access to justice. Anyone recognize anything here that's done day to day? You know, isn't this like almost everything that we do? To promote access to justice and law for law for human beings as opposed to law for incorporeal entities. Isn't this almost everything? Maybe 50 isn't that few. Maybe 50 is actually kind of enough. Okay, well, civil versus criminal law. That's one division that many in the room that went to law school would recognize, although I recently found out from a couple of students that I may not have been as effective. It may have taken me like three months to teach that concept. I'm not going to glare at the student that told me that, but anyway. Within civil, we can have transactional versus adjudicatory types of law. Typically, those folks, those types of lawyers, just don't talk to each other very much because they just do such different things. If you're a litigator, you don't talk to the transactional people. Within adjudicatory, we got people that operate in courts versus people that operate in administrative agencies. Within courts, we've got a traditional litigation track versus an alternative uh, dispute resolution track, right? Lots of people specialize in ADR. Within one type of ADR, we have multiple types of mediation. So mediation has early neutral evaluation. Excuse me, ADR has mediation, early neutral evaluation, arbitration. There are five or six different types, or 12, depending on how you want, of just ways, fundamental ways of doing mediation. Have we tested? Is 50 enough just within mediation to understand how effectively we should do mediation? But 50 is the entire scope of what we know in the United States legal profession in this rigorous sense. In this rigorous sense. We are ignorant about what works. We are operating in a profound state of ignorance, but it need not be permanent. <laughs> Yes, I love this character. We have its creator here with us. What do we do? What do we do here at the Access to Justice Lab? How are we trying to change this? We incorporate lessons from other fields. We arbitrage. Some of the stuff, you know, occasionally someone will come up and say, gosh, you know, that was a really creative idea that you came up with. It wasn't a really creative idea. We didn't come up with it. How much have we come up with new in the Access to Justice Lab that like, nobody really conceived of before? One, I would argue, nothing. The only idea that we have come up with is not being terrified to read lessons that other people have learned already and try to adapt them. And so what do we, what do we adopt? We go from adult education to junk mail. We read the junk mail literature in the Access to Justice Lab. We design interventions, <clears throat> self-help interventions, practice improvement interventions, outreach mechanism interventions, communication interventions, and we evaluate. 
We evaluate with access to duct, excuse me, with uh, randomized control trials. We evaluate our own interventions, and we evaluate others. That's what we do. Do we do civil or criminal? Yes. Do we do agency or adjudicatory uh, evaluations? Yeah, I mean, I actually have to say agency or court evaluations. Yes. Do we do ADR or traditional litigation? Yes. Do we do specialized courts or generalized courts? We've already done both. Do we do self-help or services-based interventions? Yes. Do we do limited assistance or full traditional attorney-client relationship? Yeah. We do it. Do we do federal courts or state courts? We're currently underway in both settings already. Do we do various stages of the civil of civil uh, legal services? Outreach, intake, triage, service delivery. Yeah. We do all of it. These projects are already underway. They're more planned. Maybe too many. We do not stop at the courthouse steps. There are theories, I agree with many of them, that say that actually what happens in the courthouse is all we should care about. If what you care about is the rule of law, then we really got to focus hard on the courthouse. But they are overstated if they are caricature. The caricature version of that is overstated. People care about more than that. People care about whether I got a judgment of eviction against me in a summary eviction proceeding. But they also care about whether I had to move out of my apartment. And those two things can be quite different. What the court judgment says and whether I had to move out. And maybe we care less about whether I had to move out of this apartment, but whether I have stable <coughs> housing. Maybe that's what we really care about. OK, well, if that's the case, we can't stop at the courthouse steps. We have to keep measuring after the fact, a year or two or three, in a debt collection proceeding. We can see whether there is a judgment in favor of a debt collecting plaintiff. We can see that. We just look at court records. But suppose we avoided that judgment. Suppose we did that. Does that help the debt collection defendant in any substantial way down the road? By the way, if you want to help a debt collection defendant avoid a judgment against him or her, there's a much cheaper way to do it than getting a lawyer, providing a lawyer. How would you do that? Buy the debt ahead of time and forgive it, right? Then you can buy it for like three or four cents on the dollar, whereas a lawyer costs whatever lawyers cost. In the study that we're doing, we're projecting somewhere between $1,100 and $1,200 per case for an overall look at financial circumstances, including debt collection, right? What else do we do? We teach. We teach via short course that we are creating. We currently have 60 or more now, 60 or more law students working on Access to Justice Lab projects and undergraduate students. You will meet some of them tonight if you can come to dinner. They will be here. You will hear from two of them later on in the day. We spread the message. Social media conference publications. We try to get out the word. Let's turn law into an evidence-based field. Let's not be afraid of lessons from other from other from non-law fields. And we do projects. We do evaluations. What are what is the Access to Justice Lab? It is a as you've heard, is it a research initiative within the Harvard Center of the Harvard uh, Law School Center of the Legal Profession? And right now, in two years and one and uh, two and a quarter years, we die if we can't keep it going. We are on a three-year funding clock for a generous grant from the Laura and, uh, John Arnold Foundation. That's the C grant, and that's what we have. We are two researchers, faculty director, project manager, research associate. We have a partnership with the Graphics Advocacy Project and the 60 law students at any given time. We have research partners all across the country. 
We have field partners all across the country. We are in at least 10 states in active projects right now. Go out ongoing or actively planned randomized controlled trials ongoing right now. This is who we are. I want to tell you, okay, I want to give you the opportunity, I should say, to hear more about specific projects that we have underway. One criminal, one civil. I'm going to introduce the Access to Justice Lab's research director, Chris Griffin. He's going to tell you about the criminal law project that we're doing. It started randomization two weeks ago in Madison, Wisconsin. And then Erica Rickard, Associate Director of Field Research, is going to present one that we have had in planning now for about 18 months to two years, and that we is, is perhaps the most challenging in terms of the assault on the professional identity, the lawyer identity that I mentioned to begin with. So, Chris. Justice Lab, and I'm going to, as Jim said, discuss one of our really marquee projects, and that is the evaluation of what is known as the Public Safety Assessment, or the PSA, as I will refer to it this afternoon. And the PSA um, comes from a particular problem. It's going to be a problem that is familiar to many in this room, and perhaps not to others, revolving around the real crisis, and I think it's appropriate to use the word crisis in this case, with how we treat individuals who have been arrested on a charge in the criminal system and are incarcerated before they've been found guilty. And the process by which they are handled is in general known as the bail system. But when you hear the word bail, you often think straight away about monetary conditions. And in fact, I want us to think about bail for purposes of the PSA evaluation as a menu of options for how to handle an individual who has been arrested and booked and who appears before a judicial official while still incarcerated. So they have not bonded out by putting up uh, either a surety bond or cash bail amount and secured their release already. They're coming before the judicial official and that official is going to set the conditions after hearing from the state and its recommendation after hearing from a public defender if one is present. And to keep things simple, the forms that we're thinking about in this evaluation range from release on your own, own recognizance, maybe with some conditions attached to it. For example, in Madison, Wisconsin, where Jim said the evaluation has gone live, even when people are released without any monetary conditions, the official there known as a commissioner might still say, Mr. Jones, you may not be in the 2600 block of Main Street. Mr. Jones, you may not go to this establishment because you have uh, shoplifted there. It can go to something like pretrial monitoring. Maybe there's an ankle bracelet condition imposed. Maybe someone has to come to pretrial services and undergo a drug test. Then you get what are the tried and true monetary conditions, what is the source for many people of this crisis. Either a surety bond can be posted where the defendant is not required to post the full face value of the bail amount, or in places like Madison, where there is no surety bond system allowed, they actually have to post the full amount in cash bail that is forfeited if they don't return uh, for the next court appearance. And this system that's been in place for incarcerating before adjudication has a number of costs associated with it. I've reduced them to two main costs that, regardless of one's place on the political spectrum, have been identified as something problematic and worthy of reform. Let's say, uh, in a very simplistic way, that the political right might focus on the systemic costs that are associated with predisposition incarceration. That could literally be the fact that you have to house inmates in the jail before they've been found guilty. It could also be 
what I mentioned, pre, uh, pre-trial services and monitoring, those aren't free. Those require staff, they require other resources, and so the public's tax dollars have to go towards programs like that. The left side of the political spectrum might focus more on the personal costs that the defendant experiences. These could be um, disruption in the home, being away from families, it could be disruption from employment that uh, they may have had before they were arrested and charged. And both of these things, plus many others, are borne by the defendant. Their freedom and their liberty have been taken away, again, before adjudication. So the question before us, when we're thinking about reforming the bail system is, how can we maintain a balance between the twin objectives of maintaining public safety and ensuring the bodily integrity and the freedom and liberty of the defendants who are still awaiting final adjudication. This slide gives you just a brief sense of, uh, through the numbers, what the problem's extent might be, that for the over 600,000 incarcerated persons around the United States, a good 70% are held before they are found guilty. And if you look at this chart, what it's trying to show is, especially on these left two columns here, These are the uh, median pre-incarceration incomes for various combinations of sex and race race or ethnicity. And you have people unable to meet their bail requirements with extremely low median incomes. If you are African American, male or female, you're hovering between $9,000 and $11,000 of income. And with bail set, sometimes in the thousands of dollars, that could be a really steep condition to meet. In addition, when I so that was more on the personal side, looking at the defendants. When you look at the system, this graph is showing that just between 25 and 30 percent of county jails that responded to the survey said that their capacity was at 81 to 99 percent. There are just too many people being held predisposition. So what is the solution before us? The one that has received a lot of attention and is the subject of our RCT is the actuarial risk assessment. This type of risk assessment tries to use real, concrete, objective information that can be gleaned from administrative data. Especially the one that we're looking at, the PSA, requires no interview-based information. And yet, there's already a lot of backlash against this idea. You have academics who say that they involve serious value conflicts and raise serious constitutional questions. The former Attorney General, Eric Holder, in a speech, was concerned that risk assessments may inadvertently undermine our efforts to ensure individualized and equal justice. What we want to do is ask, even though we take those concerns seriously, if we have a risk assessment tool that avoids a lot of those problematic inputs, that uses static criminal history, is it better than the status quo? There, of course, is a lot of bias. I'm not talking about race or gender bias. There's bias in the way that judges already perceive the risk that someone poses to the community for being let out predisposition. What we want to say is, can we measure whether something like the PSA does better above and beyond the status quo already infected by bias? And the PSA was developed in conjunction by our benefactors at the Lauren John Arm Foundation and Luminosity, um, where Marie Van Nostrand of that organization developed the science behind it using 1.5 million cases around the country to say what might seem obvious to us right now, that the best predictor of your failure upon release, failing to appear for the next court date, committing a new criminal act, is really based on your history of doing those things. And so that's what goes into the development, not into the assessment, not these problematic variables like race, gender, education level, socioeconomic status, where you live. It's all based on the static criminal history. And as I just mentioned, one of the uh, ideas put out by the Arnold Foundation is that the PSA obviates the need for interviewing these defendants and gathering a lot of the time and resource consuming information that people use right now in making arguments about what bail should be. And it also doesn't rely primarily on the current charge, because you can imagine that a judge seeing a defendant and noting that it's a severe violent crime, let's say, might equate that with risk in releasing that individual. When in fact, if we really think about 
what risks matter, it could be general criminal activity, it could be general failure to appear for the next court date. So the RCT that we have in place right now, it is live. Uh, the PSA is being provided randomly to the commissioner in Dane County and Madison, and we are hoping to do the same thing in two more counties in Iowa and four additional counties in Utah, including Salt Lake City, where if we can pull that off, it will be a really scientifically exciting experiment because Salt Lake is the only one of any of these counties that has ever had a pretrial risk assessment tool in place. They decided to jettison that tool and adopt the PSA, and so we're going to do a head-to-head -head battle, so to speak, between that old risk assessment and the PSA. And if you think about this, at the end of the day, what these RCTs look like in practice is, in the randomly selected half of cases, a piece of paper is provided to the judicial official, the state's attorney, and a public defender if one is there, and in a randomly selected other half, it's not. So to get to the place where we're handing a piece of paper, in some cases and not, takes a vast amount of work. About one and a half years in the case of the Dane County experiment, since I joined the lab in July to get Iowa and Utah off the ground, because we have to work, and we enjoy working with so many stakeholders in the criminal justice system. And that's just a list of with whom we have worked in Dane County, and it's been really enriching to hear a lot of the principles and values that Jim was talking about, about not just buying into the conventional wisdom. This is the approach that our partners um, in all of these jurisdictions are really taking, and it's, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to see that they're willing to subject their understanding of how the bail system should work to a new idea and to evaluate it at the same time. Chris, yes, sir. are the judges in these studies agreeing to abide by the results? Great question. They do not have to take, it's a recommendation that appears on the PSA printout. And that word is very important because it is only a recommendation. All of these judicial officials will retain the discretion to choose their own release condition. And so part of our study will, of course, be to see how often they concur yeah. with that recommendation. The outcomes that we're going to measure very quickly, I'll just focus on the first couple because they're the ones of most interest. We want to know, thinking about the cost to the individual defendant, how long do they actually spend incarcerated between their initial appearance and case disposition? How often do those who are released, who do secure their release, fail to appear for the next court date? And how many commit a new violent or nonviolent criminal act during that predisposition period? Um, the other uh, outcomes are things that happen after um, the guilty verdict is brought down and a sentence is, is uh, issued, but they're, they're important for the lifespan of the case. But what I want to focus on here thinking is that window of time between release and being found guilty or innocent, what are we going to do about those individuals when released? We're going to hopefully provide better, more objective information to judicial officials to make their decisions. And lastly, we're going to test directly. Would you be better off not having those defendant interviews? So in the cases in which the PSA is used, we'll also be able to say, did the addition of interview-based information, would that have given us any better sense of the risk that this defendant posed? And we'll also be testing whether, in fact, as the foundation has reported, the risk tool is race neutral in a very limited sense for right now, that if you are assigned to the same risk scores that the PSA provides, do you fail at the same rate regardless of your race or ethnicity? That's the definition that they're going on, that's the one that we will test, and that is I'm sorry, say that, that um, I, I didn't have time to show you how this leads to two risk scores, one for failure to appear, one for new criminal activity, and that gets put into a matrix with the recommendation as the combination of those two scores. But the comparison so, is between? The comparison is if you end up in the same combination of risk scores, then regardless of your race or ethnicity, you will be predicted to fail at the same rate. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Associate Director of Field Research, my colleague Erica Rickard. Erica, and I'm going to be talking about one more case study 
also focus on decision making by legal actors. Uh, unlike Chris, this is not about judges, this is about legal aid attorneys or legal services providers and triage decisions that they make, specifically in the context of intimate partner violence or IPV. So I think at the outset I want to describe what we mean when we say triage. Uh, folks might mean different things. What we're talking about is basically scarcity compelled choice. So if you think about whether it's in an emergency room or a legal services intake or any field, when you have a scarce resource and more people who are trying to access that resource and you're trying to allocate who gets which level of service, that's what we're talking about. So we're kind of talking about tiers of levels of service, the most scarce resource in the legal services field being limited, or excuse me, full representation, uh, where one attorney represents one client for the life of their case. There are slightly more access to limited advice and self-help materials, and as we talked about before, uh, a bulk of people who are accessing the court system pro se, being, being the, the largest part, the largest part of the pyramid. What this means for legal aid providers is they have to make a decision about who is going to be assigned to which level of service. So people call and legal aid attorneys are assessing these cases and then assigning them to a level of service. So for a small number of cases, assigning them to full representation, assigning a larger set to limited representation, and the rest receiving no service at all. So this is a world that we're all pretty familiar with. And one, one more piece I want to add to that is the idea of nascent demand. So there's this whole other group of people that we don't even see, right? The people who never call, who don't know that they have a legal problem, or don't know about the legal resources available. And by their very nature, they're also in the uh, group that's receiving no assistance whatsoever. So this is, the, this is the field of play. It's the field of play in Ohio as much as anywhere else. The field partner that we're working with on our IPD case, uh, study is Ohio Community Legal Aid. And in Ohio, we did a, a quick analysis of the number of civil protection orders or restraining orders that are filed. And of course, just like everywhere else, a very, very small number of people actually have an attorney with them when they go in the courthouse. The vast majority are coming with no lawyer at all. In, in this situation, in these eight counties in Ohio where community legal aid works, they're serving about between 6 and 7% uh, of the total number of people who are seeking restraining orders. So we know that there is, realistically speaking, no amount of resources that's going to change the dynamic where legal aid is suddenly going to be able to provide the full level of representation that they would like to for all these clients. What we don't know is which cases they should be taking, right? We're making our best guess at those sorts of things. Uh, we, we did a quick analysis of the success rates of who uh, obtains civil protection orders in Ohio, and a little bit troubling what we saw was in about half of the counties that legal aid serves, people's success rate of actually receiving a civil protection order was a, you know, a little bit higher if they didn't have a lawyer than if they did. Um, similar to what Jim talked about with juvenile delinquency, it doesn't necessarily mean what it might sound like it means. We're not quite sure what this means, right? We're, we haven't done any kind of rigorous evaluation to determine who's seeking a restraining order, who, which clients are reaching out to attorneys, and which ones are actually receiving attorneys. This is calling out for some kind of rigorous evaluation, right? which is, of course, where we come in. Uh, so we're going to be conducting a pretty huge study. This is, I think, going to be pretty groundbreaking in a number of ways. It's also a soup to nuts kind of operation. We're both providing the actual one of the actual interventions itself. So for folks who don't receive full representation, we're building self-help materials that are going to make a more robust set of resources for people who don't get that, that top level of scarce resource. Uh, we also have this whole robust field operation in the, uh, as a randomized study that I'll go into more detail. And uh, lastly, we're doing a more long-term outcome analysis. So for everyone who calls legal aid, we're going to be following not only to see whether they received a restraining order or not, but also following those individuals for a period of two years to see more long-term outcomes that we can assess. This wouldn't be possible without a strong field partner on the ground, Community Legal Aid in Ohio. We're also working with the court system in Ohio is, is, has bought into this project. We're also working with the battered women's shelters in the area who funnel a lot of the intake into legal aid, uh, as well as our research partner at the University of Akron to do that long-term study that I described. Okay, so what we want to look at with this randomized study is which cases should they take, right? What, in which situations does a lawyer make a difference? We were looking at that, that previous analysis of success rates. The success rates alone tell us that lawyers aren't necessarily the make or break for everyone. There is some group in this slide, group one, uh, of people who maybe because of their own self-advocacy ability or because of the cl clear, compelling evidence in their case, they're going to get a restraining order 
whether they have a lawyer or not. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the folks who, no matter the best efforts of the attorney, isn't going to make the difference, and they're not going to receive a restraining order. So what community legal aid wants to find is that middle group, the group where the lawyer is the difference between whether someone does or does not receive the safety and protection of, that a restraining order provides. How do we figure out which people are in that group is, is the real challenge. So this is where the randomized study comes in. This is, may look a little complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it step by step. So the first step, which is what's happening right now, people call in to legal aid and ask for legal help. We're actually going to boost the numbers there, of the, increase the number of people who call to address that nascent demand issue that I talked about before. People come in and they receive the same kind of eligibility and assessment that legal aid provides right now, where they're determining whether someone is eligible for legal aid services and whether they have some uh, meritorious case, whether they're in the realm of the cases that a legal aid attorney would take if they could take 100% of the cases that they wanted to. Once they've done that initial test, once they've done that initial analysis, they're going to make a triage decision. Would, would you assign this case to full representation or to some kind of limited assistance, which is going to be uh, telephone advice and a self-help packet? Now, legal aid, this is the uncomfortable part. Legal aid is going to hold on to that decision for a minute. They're going to pass that case on to the Access to Justice Lab. We're going to do two stages of randomization. The first step is we'll randomly decide whether to assign that case to the level of service that the attorney selected, or in a randomly selected group of cases, we're going to have a computer decide. And for that second group, they're going to be a, there's going to be a second stage of randomization, where some cases will be assigned to full representation, and some will be assigned to limited representation. So that ultimate decision that the computer makes might actually be the same as what the attorney had made, but it might be different. Then the Access to Justice Lab brings that final determination back to legal aid, and they serve the client based on that determination. We then follow up with that case to see both the adjudicatory outputs of whether they received a restraining order or not, and then the longer term outcomes over the life of that case over the next two years. By doing this two different stages of randomization, we're going to be able to answer so many more research questions than in, its, in the other studies that have ever been done. We'll be able to see both which types of factors attorneys are using when making their triage decisions, because we'll have that initial input, the data of the initial client and the type of case that they had, to be able to see what cases attorneys are taking for full representation and what cases they're not. By doing a randomization and having a computer assign some cases to full rep and some cases to limited, we're also going to be able to see in which cases can, a, can someone represent themselves adequately, and in which cases does a lawyer actually make a difference. And then by doing a longer term outcome analysis, we're also going to be able to see the effect that a restraining order actually has on that person's other circumstances in their life by following up after two years. So we'll be able to see a little bit more about what role a civil protection order actually has in the first place. Folks, have any questions? Um, how, if at all, are you going to account for judicial variability in terms of the way that judges run their courtrooms? Since you're going across counties, you have elected judges in Ohio. It's so, free, so that's free a, for all, every courtroom in That's Ohio. a great question. So, it's, so there's a lot of different courtrooms. So we're talking about eight different counties and multiple uh, magistrates within each county. And one of, the, one of the challenges that we've seen, like for example, when we were looking at the success rates of people who came to court without a lawyer and came to court who didn't, we can't really tell which uh, we're looking at apples and oranges, and we're not sure which ones are which. With this randomized study, we've got apples, we've got oranges, we've got bananas, we've got all the judges and all the counties, and the, every, in a large enough group of people that are, have a randomly assigned outcome, right? A randomly assigned level of service. So that's going to be true in, regardless of which judge it is, and regardless of the circumstances of that individual case. So by sheer volume, the number of people that are different from one another are all going to be in the same pool, and they're all going to be randomly assigned to different, to different service providers. But will you be keeping hold of that data point of what judges attach to which Oh, absolutely. Cases? Absolutely. We'll so be able to see the differences between, yeah. uh, between counties and between attorneys as well. Um, but the, I think the, the key point is that the overall group it, it is going to be randomly assigned to yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Is identifying the cases in group two what you think the intake attorneys should be doing, or is it what they think they're doing? I mean, I, Couple examples, right? I can imagine uh, that you would want to have perhaps provision of legal services more for someone whose husband is heavily armed than someone who isn't, even if you didn't think that affected the percentage chances of getting the order or not getting the order for every support. It may be more important to 
to bump someone's chances of getting an order from 55% to 95 than to bump it from 45 to 55. But that's the difference. Right, one of those is your group one, I think, and the other right. is group two. Yeah, so, and so I think the answer is... Do, or is it just what you think they should be doing? It's both. It's both what they think they should be doing and what they're trying to do, right? So what, what we, as Jim was describing before, this is, this is our best guess as lawyers using whatever information we have available because we don't have any rigorous analysis. But of course, so there are some legal aid providers or prosecutors or others who might actually be taking those cases where they think they can win, right? Where they're, more, they're most interested in the cases that they will have a success rate. This legal aid organization is really interested in figuring out where they can help. So figuring out, no, understanding the fact that for every person that you're serving that would get a restraining order with or without you, and for every person that you're serving who doesn't have a chance, that's resources that you're wasting that could be spent actually getting resources, getting restraining orders for people who won't otherwise get them. And so what's really compelling to me about this study is we have a field partner who's willing to make themselves uncomfortable for the duration of the study and let a computer be involved in their decision making, which is, as Jim said, kind of a threat to their professional identity because they want to provide better services with the resource constraints that they have. One more question. So in, in legal aid practice, we often have an operating theory that um, one judge may be more friendly to pro se's and another judge may be less friendly, um, that one set of fact patterns may work better for pro se or may be worse. And the challenge for you, to the extent you can track those kinds of separations, I would think is going to be numerosity, that at some point you just don't have enough numbers in those subcategories. Is, do you have any conversation so far with a legal aid provider of if you get hints in the study that there are those kinds of, maybe not, not enough numerosity to have statistical significance, but hints that there may be those kinds of differences, any interest in considering follow-up study to explore those kinds of specifics? I can't wait to do a follow-up study. This is going to be great. Um, the, one, one answer to your point is uh, we are capturing a lot of background variables of the people who are calling in. So we know that with among the legal aid provider, there are differences of opinion about which factors matter, which factors right. they're taking in their cases. So we'll actually have that kind of uh, more laundry list type, not an individual triage decision, but all of the factors that different attorneys might have assessed differently. Um, so I think that that's going to be, that'll, that'll help address that to, to some extent, but I think um, it's a valid point that we're going to have to consider. Um, so now what? Um, so, great, we've got a short break. Um, okay, everybody, here's, let's, let's go. Here's what's going on. Um, I may be amplified at this point. Um, okay, it's not too loud? Because I, my voice cares. Okay. Um, we're going to ask you, I, I'm not supposed to say this, I'm going to say it anyway. We're going to put you to work. Um, we're going to ask you to help us solve a problem that we have encountered and have proposals to solve, but we don't know whether we have the right proposal. We don't know whether it be the right idea. We're going to go to a randomized experiment to try to figure that out. And the basic origin of this problem is uh, it really starts about three year, three ish years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, maybe four, I can't remember exactly, um, looking at some of the folks who already tried to do. It, which is basically that a legal services um, uh, provider uh, called um, me or contacted me and basically said, we have the strangest problem that any legal services provider has ever encountered, which is we have an excess of legal representation power, and it's not currently being used well. Um, and I said, OK, how does that happen? And the way it happens is basically that the setting is, we're going to say small claims court. The first study was actually in a court level above a small claims court. But the continuation study is in a small claims court, which is a court system designed to interface with individuals without lawyers. In fact, in, some, in at least a handful of eight, nine states around the country, you are not allowed to come into and appear in a small claims court if you are a lawyer, unless you are the party. You cannot represent someone. So this is the basic idea. Small claims courts are supposed to be pro se accessible. That's how they're set up, right? And the basic idea is, basic problem um, is that there are lots and lots and lots of cases filed in small claims courts. A very high volume uh, case, uh, uh, case volume. 
And a very high uh, percentage of those cases are just garden variety debt collection cases against individual defendants. They t almost always are brought by credit card companies or debt buyers who are buying credit card company debt or sometimes hospital debt, but usually credit card company debt. Why is that? Because the credit card is the lender of last resort for, uh, for, for, for many people. And uh, the idea in the small claims court is that these lawsuits are filed and the defendant, the person who is sued, need not answer the lawsuit. It's, a, again, a pro se accessible uh, 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 court. You just, you get a trial date and you show up. And then you, and then you have the case, right? And that's what's going on. Um, and there is a lawyer for the day program by a particular legal service provider. Again, this is going on around Massachusetts and around the country, so we're just going to make it generic. Um, there is a lawyer for the day program there. What is a lawyer for the day program there? It's exactly what it sounds like. You get a lawyer for that day, and there are lawyers waiting outside the courthouse, the courtroom, inside the courthouse, and you approach them, if you are the defendant, and you say, I'd like some help, you know, and they maybe give you a little quick income um, screen or something like that, and then they say, okay, I will help you, and the way I will help you is I will do an interview with you for 15 to 20 minutes, find out the facts and circumstances of your case, and uh, maybe look at some documents if you have any. And then I will undertake the following. I will negotiate with the opposing side. Uh, I will appear before you in court, appear on your behalf in court to argue in motion. I will not typically take a case to trial because the, on the theory that a lawyer would need to prepare more or find out more about the case. But I will at least negotiate and argue um, for you. But as I mentioned, it, around the country in many settings, the lawyers are born. Um, and in, in, in the initial study, in the initial things, uh, uh, the initial uh, circumstances that gave rise to this problem, there were approximately uh, one, uh, the ratio of clients to lawyers was about one to three on a typical day. So each client had three lawyers willing to represent the client. Um, and so that's just kind of weird, right? <laughs> Whereas the lawyers could actually have, you know, they could have represented three or four people per day because the engagement is limited. And so there's a lot of underutilized uh, representation capacity. And why is that happening? And the reason is basically folks aren't showing up, right? They're not coming in. They're not coming in to contest their cases. And that, again, by itself is kind of weird. And why is it? Well, because we actually think when we research the law here, when we look hard at the law, and look hard at some non-randomized data, okay, some non-randomized data. But we actually think, you know, that if they did show up, they might win, right? Or they might settle for cheap or cheaper than they certainly do if they don't show up. Because if you don't show up, you lose automatically. And the plaintiff gets everything the plaintiff asked for, right? So, okay, why is that? Well, that, that requires a more extended discussion than I want to offer, at least without a question, I want to offer in terms of the potential pathologies in the debt collection industry, especially the debt buying industry. Basically, what it comes down to is in our legal system, if you sue, you are the plaintiff, you have the burden of proof. You have to show that you should win the case. And the defendant doesn't have to show anything except, and so if there's no evidence, then the defendant wins. That's how our legal system works. And in many of these cases, the plaintiffs who are filing lots and lots of these debt collection lawsuits know that they are going to encounter a 90 to 95% default rate, and so they don't bother to get the evidence because getting the evidence costs money, right? And even for the debt buyers, at the moment when they buy the debt, they pay, pay cry, price X to buy the rights to the debt if, in fact, they do that. It's another potential pathology. They may sue without the rights if they do that, but they pay price 3x if you buy the debt with the evidence that you would need to prove it. And since they don't have to do that, they don't. Right? And so if you showed up, you might well win. This is the theory anyway. This is the situation that we became we became persuaded that this was a theory that should be investigated. Okay? So it might well be in people's economic interests to show up. They might be able to resist. Or it might not, depending on their own individual circumstances or something. But in any case, it seems kind of strange to us. So the task that we're going to ask you to undertake. How do we get small claims court debt collection defendants to show up? How do we do that? Because we think it would be good for them, and we think there is legal representation there available to them, not full representation, but a, uh, but a, uh, a lawyer for the day program. What do we have available in terms of communicating with them? 
Well, every time we present this particular problem, which we've been working on in some form or another for four or five years, but he said, text messages, Facebook, Instagram, you know, all this other stuff, I'm tweet, I'm not, I'm not on any of this, so I only have, you know, a, a sort of uncertain idea of what it looks like. We don't have that, right? What we've got is the name of the plaintiff, name of the plaintiff's attorney. We can tell from that the type of case, whether it's a debt buyer or, or an original issuer of credit cards. So we can identify the set of cases that we're interested in. We've got the name of the defendant and an address of the defendant. I say an address because one of the pathologies in the system is we may not have the right address. Um, and we may not have, we, you can assume for now that we got the right defendant in terms of the right name of the defendant. The very first person that I ever met when I began to do this work had, uh, had actually paid off her debt in full. She had just paid it back to her original credit card. And by the time the company, by the time she sold, by that, by that time, by the time she paid it off, the credit card company had already sold her debt to a debt buyer. So she paid off the wrong defendant and got sued by the right one. Other people do suffer identity theft. You know, so that is a thing, right? And many of those people, at least when we try to talk with them, is they say, oh, I, I didn't respond to the lawsuit because I knew this didn't have anything to do with me. And then they lose. And then they have, and then they have to get you know, on, on the hook. Anyway, the idea is we've got a name and we've got an address, but that's kind of it. That's, all, that's basically all we have. So what we're going to ask you to do, we're going to divide you up into groups. And each group is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jim. Do mm -hmm. we have access to the court date? Yes. We know the court date. You know the court date. Because the court date is set within 48 hours of the filing of the lawsuit, typically. And so by the time we mail, which is typically three, you know, two or three days later, we will have access to the court date. And how far in advance do we have the court date? That's something. Oh, we have the court date in enough time. How, I thought you were going to ask how far in advance should we mail the letter, and that's something for you to think about. Well, that's something for the group. But in exactly. order to figure that out, we need to know how much time we have. Before. I see what you're saying. Um, it varies from court system to court system, but why don't we assume three months? Because that's a sort of typical time. Three months is, is a time from when we get the data downloaded until the court system. There are some courts that have that do six weeks. There are others that do four and a half. So we're just kind of, kind of four and a half months. Excuse me, not four and a half weeks, four and a half months. We're going to have to split the difference. Okay? So what are we going to ask you to do? We're going to ask you, they're going to be, your group is actually signed right there. Okay? And each of you has a group leader. And each group leader will call out your name because you know who you are at the right time. And you will um, have a uh, go to one of the hubs. If you look at one of these hubs, which are these gigantic, super fun toys, right? Um, and the group leaders know how to use the hubs, right? Are you going to do the 10 minute tutorial? Or are you going to be okay? We're okay. We're going to do, we basically, the group leaders know how to do a hub. And it's basically a, a tablet, it's a drawing tablet. And so the group leader can hold the pen or pass around the pen, depending on what you want to do, okay? And basically, what I want you to come back uh, from with is answers to some of, some or all as many of these as these questions as you can answer. Right? What should the look and feel of the mailing be, and why? What are you thinking about? What information should it contain? Right? What research would you do if you had a lot of time to solve this problem to design the mailing? And where, what non-law fields might have some information about it? What would you try to do? Okay, as some of you are familiar with our ideas that we propose and are trying to get out in the field, but I will tell you, <laughs> don't need to be limited by those. And when we ran this exercise in a recent class, one of David Wilkins' class, the class just came up with totally different stuff from what we, we had come up with before. Um, so this is what we want to do. Um, so what we're going to ask you to do right now, by the way, group leaders, no one, don't ever hit the I'm done button on the hub, okay? You might think that will save everything and then it, and then it can be emailed somewhere else. It deletes everything. It deletes all of your work if you hit the I'm done button on the hub, okay? You've got about 45 minutes to do this and then you're going to be in a break for until, until 4, okay? Create your own proposal, draw it, write it, brainstorm, whatever you want to do the hub is an infinite whiteboard, so you can write as many things as you, you want and just keep moving it around, um, et cetera. And then we will come by and yell, you know, for, for 345, time for the break, okay? And then you'll have your break, and then we will reconvene um, at that point. Questions? Jim? Yes? Could you just very succinctly say what is the objective of that communication that you want us to say? Get people to the Lawyer for the Day program. Because okay? we actually, 
we actually ran into this problem. It's an excellent question. There are a couple of different objectives. You could say avoid default, right? But avoid default, you might that might be accomplished if the plaintiff dismisses the case before the first the first hearing, and that can occur if they negotiate. But our thought is at least for this setting. And again, we we, we use different measures of success when we ran you know the, the first preliminary pilot study on this. And one, the measure we're thinking about, our thought process behind this is get them to the Lawyer for the Day program. They need a lawyer to tell them that they might actually have really good defenses. Right? And so, and, you know, because if they're not watching John Oliver, you know, if they're not listening to radio to, um, to uh, uh, This American Life, the whole This American Life um, uh, segment on where you're just supposed to, you know, what happens if you walk in and say, where's the evidence? Right, there's an entire 45 minute, you know, they, they, I mean, I've heard it, right? They need a lawyer to walk in and tell them that. And so we want to get them to the lawyer on the day. We'd rather actually not have them negotiate before, beforehand. Okay, okay. Does that, you. that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay, questions? Yes. What dollar value are we supposed to assume is at stake here? Yep. Because small claims limits in state courts can vary from yep. 2000 to 25000 Yep, exactly. And so we'll say that this one is a mess. It's a 7500 How much 7000 Yeah, it's off of $500. So $7,000 upper ceiling on the amount of controversy. Yes? What are the resource constraints on the treatments? I mean, you could offer them $20 to come in and see the lawyers, but I imagine. That's fine. How would we do if we did that? <laughs> we might run into a little bit of trouble if we did that. So you would want to at least think about, there are enough lawyers in the room to at least think about what sort of ethical issues and, and et cetera. Legal and ethical implications aside, I mean, you know, can we, would color, would color letters be too expensive? What? You know? Don't worry about that now. In other words, do brainstorm about color letters, you know, and color, the use of color, which is one of the things we, we, we brainstormed about. And then think, you know, maybe right over on the side might be expensive or something like that, right? Paying them directly, I can tell you, is out. Because you know, <laughs> we'll get into trouble if we do that. Okay? Other questions? Yes? Uh, so they, they have to see the lawyer only for the day at the courthouse. They couldn't to talk to the lawyer ahead of time. And, and actually, that's, yes, the reason your question, and that's accurate because in some cases, at least, in some of the programs that are doing this sort of work, they will not know which lawyers are going to be there on a particular day. Right? They're, in some of the programs, they're using volunteer lawyers from the community, and this is you know, litigators doing pro bono hours or something like that, and they will not know day to day who's going to, who's going to be there, or week to week who's going to be there. Okay? Yes? Well, following Catherine's question, mm -hmm. do the um, lawyer for a day programs assume you're, uh, you're seeing the lawyer on the date of your hearing, yes. or can you show up, talk to somebody, and then, your hearing's three weeks away? Um, I think probably the former for the purposes of this exercise. I've actually never thought hard about the latter. Or you could tell them, you know, like, show up on a Wednesday and talk to the lawyer, and then maybe you go off and do some more investigation or something like that, um, which is actually something to think about, right? Because it typically is predictable on the day of the week. It might be that after the lawyer is done, particularly if they are undersubscribed, they could talk to you about, well, go find, you know, do, do this investigation and then come back on your, yeah. Um, we have never, uh, quite frankly, this is why we're doing this exercise. I've never thought of that, right? I at least have never thought of that. Um, so for now, I'll try to get them to, the, to, the, to, their, to their particular court dates. But this is an excellent idea already that I had, I had just never considered. Okay? Questions? Other questions? Some of the groups may be a tad small because folks have tried to come in and out um, or you know, need to come in and out during the day. So if you've got a small group, then you're in charge. you got the pen. What are you going to come up with? Right? Okay? All right. Can we have group leaders stand up? Okay? So if you are a group leader, so this is group seven, group one, uh, Brian, Nathan is group three, Rosanna is group five, John is group four, Derek is group two, Hallie is group six, and Andrea is group eight. Oh, that, that's everybody, right? And there is, uh, each of the group leaders has a little handout in case you want to refresh your recollection as to the stuff that was just presented on the, on the, on the slides. Uh, again, we will, I will or someone else with an even louder voice than I have will wander around at 3.45 and tell you to take your break. And we'll reconvene at 4 o'clock. Okay? So group leaders, call out and go find your hubs.